I want to thank everybody for coming and coming to visit us here at Clary. Uh, we have an excellent speaker that I will introduce to you very shortly. But in the meantime, let me just uh, give you some status and updates on the group. So this is approximately our 20th event. And uh, the number of members of the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Group, including those of you who come here in person and those of you who watch online from the comfort of your own sofas, is almost 5,000 members. So for those of you who come here and enjoy the talk every time, uh, also there are many others who are enjoying it from home. Now one corollary of that is in the end we like to have a significant amount of time for Q&A. We have so many great speakers that have so much knowledge and they always don't always think to tell you all of their secrets. So it's good to ask at the end. But when you are asking, please uh, make sure you have an opportunity to get this little wandering microphone that I'm talking into now. So when you ask questions, try to save questions to the end. And when you get to the end and ask questions, try to ask them with the mic. Someone will be able to pass it around. And that makes sure that everybody who's, you know, our viewers at home hear not only the answers, but, but the questions being answered. Uh, I'd like to start out, before I introduce our speaker, to introduce you to uh, Venkat Rangan. He is the uh, CTO of Clary.ai. There are hosts tonight at this beautiful venue. And uh, he's going to tell you for a moment about Clary and what's going on at Clary. And then uh, I'll take the mic back and introduce our speaker. Venkat? Thank you, Adrian. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Clary is pleased to welcome back Silicon Valley Deep uh, Learning Group. It's been our pleasure hosting this group here. Um, I think this must be our fourth or fifth meeting. Uh, so we uh, take um, a lot of pride in being able to participate and contribute to the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Group. Uh, Clary, sure, Clary is an enterprise software company. Uh, we've been around for about five and a half years now. Uh, we specialize in business software for sales teams. Our uh, mission is to transform sales. And we do that by making selling easier, forecasting uh, more predictable. We have an enterprise software solution that enables um, large and medium-sized software companies to streamline their sales operations. And we do that by delivering key AI insights all along the selling process. We analyze a lot of data we apply machine learning and data science uh, along with all the AI techniques to make it possible for sales teams to execute better, whether it is pipeline inspection, uh, forecast management, or coming up with you know, the predictions on what the quarter would look like for large enterprises. And uh, we have hundreds of customers, tens of thousands of users actively using the solution, and our tech stack is uh, based on Scala, Java, a lot of machine learning libraries and uh, software that helps uh, us provide key insights. We are actively hiring. We are looking to double our engineering team the coming year, uh, adding another um, 20 to 30 folks to our engineering teams. Uh, we also have a very exciting uh, announcement coming up later this week, and I cannot disclose what it is. So it's like a teaser for you folks. Wait until Wednesday morning for uh, the announcement to hit, hit the, the, the presses, I guess. So uh, with that, I would like to turn it back to Adrian to welcome our guest. Okay, so now without too much further ado, I'd like to welcome back Forrest Indola. Forrest has actually spoken for us before and spoke at one of our most popular lectures if viewed, gauged by online viewership. Uh, Forrest is, uh, has deep expertise in deep learning, which I guess that's how it is. Uh, Forrest did his PhD at UC Berkeley and has his expertise at the time were very much focused on optimization of deep neural networks and compression of those networks, if I understand correctly. From that technology came deep scale corporation of which Forrest is the CEO. And DeepScale applies those techniques in the automotive domain. They have several customers and engagements, if I understand correctly, and they're highly focused in applying deep learning to automotive engagements. So if you would all give a great big hand to Forrest Indola, welcome. Thanks for the wonderful introduction, Adrian. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's great to be back here again for a second time. And um, for those of you who saw my previous talk 18 months ago at the same venue at Silicon Valley Deep Learning Group, you may see some 
material that's sort of an evolution of what we had before, as well as some completely new things as well. So this talk is going to be uh, how to become a full stack deep learning engineer, which uh, as I seem to understand is a thing that a lot of people would like to be right now. Um, basically the, the way that we're gonna organize this talk is first I'll kind of tell some of my own war stories, uh, adventures in both entrepreneurship and, and deep learning and sort of intertwined in this is uh, DeepScale's founding story and sort of at the same time, how I you know, became a, a full stack deep learning engineer. Um, so you know, if you bear with me on that, I'll get to kind of part two, which is where um, I basically explain um, from my perspective, kind of synthesizing that all down, what does it really mean to do full stack deep learning engineering? What, what is the range of things that deep learning comprises um, hint, it's not just training deep neural net models all day. It's actually a very broad interdisciplinary activity. Um, for the managers and entrepreneurs in the room, I'll, I'll give some tips about, about sort of how I think about organizing a full stack deep learning team. And for, for the engineers in the room, I'll give my sort of crystallized advice on how to get into deep learning and then ultimately how to build sort of a full stack skill set in, in the deep learning space. So um, to begin with, so I'll kind of talk about my, my personal journey that, that led me to, to kind of where I am and where we as a company are today. And I'm gonna take you way back, about 25 years. So um, this is me as a small child sitting in a truck. Um, for as long as I can remember, I've been completely obsessed with cars, trucks, and well, anything with wheels. And um, you know, I was fortunate to grow up on a farm uh, seven miles from the nearest town in rural uh, Illinois. And uh, as a result, we had some land, so we didn't actually need a driver's license to drive on that land. So I had a go-kart from when I was seven years old, got my first little motorcycle at 11 or 12. Um, and, and so I, I loved vehicles. And um, this particular truck was actually used for, for a business that my parents ran. They started it when I was one year old. They still run that business today. Uh, they basically sell industrial drilling products. So if you want to drill a hole in the ground, whether that be for a water well or a caisson to support a tall building, or anything like that, my parents' company will sell you not just drill bits, but also uh, large quantities of sand and specialized types of, of clay, which much to my delight actually require having a small fleet of trucks to, to deliver them in, uh, such as this one. So since my parents had a business, naturally I wanted to have my own business too. So um, before I could even say my name properly, uh, Forrest, I called myself Foe. So this is Foe's truck company. So I you know, convinced my parents to print up shirts and letterhead uh, for, for Foe's Truck Company. Had a little desk that I called the, the headquarters of Foe's Truck Company. I wanted to make trucks. And the, the product I thought we should start with as a new truck company was, so in the, in the 90s, believe it or not, you know, if you look at the trucks that you could buy, pickup trucks, you could get a, a very large pickup truck, kind of the maximum size. You know, they call them three quarter ton or one ton trucks with uh, two full size doors on each side and you could sit, seat at least four uh, adults. Um, but if you wanted to seat four adults in a small truck, you couldn't do that. You, you basically had to buy a regular cab or extended cab, which are quite smaller. And so naturally the thing I wanted to do, I saw so many people trying to transport their families in pickup trucks. So I thought naturally we should make a smaller pickup truck with four doors. And actually if you fast forward today, um, the best selling trucks in the US are actually that smaller size, but four door configuration. So actually some trucks like the Honda Ridgeline only come in that configuration. So clearly I was onto something, but other things like kindergarten actually got in the way and uh, you know, went to school, um, ultimately got really interested in, in math and science and, and ultimately computer programming. So I was extremely fortunate to you know, make the jump from rural Illinois to suburban Chicago, where they have the Illinois Math and Science Academy. And this is a school that's basically a magnet school for the entire state of Illinois. So you have to apply to get in um, basically, it's, it's at least as complicated as applying for college. You need to take SATs, you need to do written, exam, written exams and or written essays. It was quite complicated, but um, I was extremely fortunate to get in and basically you know, go from a place in the middle of nowhere to a place that had AP classes and all the things that we take for granted uh, at the schools here in the Bay Area. Um, one thing that they had that was, was unavailable where, where I was from is, is computer programming classes which, which you know, I, I, I took to like a fish takes to water. Um, but still I was interested in cars and when I got to college, um, a couple hundred miles south of, of IMSA at the University of Illinois, 
um, I, I thought what I wanted to do was to be a mechanical engineer and to do some sort of car related engineering. Um, and, you know, a couple months into my, my plan to become a mechanical engineer, you know, I went to kind of the first job fair my freshman year. And the most interesting internship opportunity I could find was in um, basically making idler controllers for, you know, calibrating an idler controller for a cargo van, which while somewhat interesting, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a big picture thinker that really seemed more constraining than what I was looking for. Um, and I guess brief aside, kind of step out of character here, I mean, this is me when I was 18, right? I mean, today I, I realize mechanical engineering is quite a broad and interesting discipline, but at the time, you know, I thought it was this kind of constraining thing that just wasn't that interesting to me. Um, so just across campus, I ended up landing this uh, job in the swanky uh, brand new computer science building where uh, Tom Siebel of Siebel Systems had actually been one of the major donors in the, the Siebel Center for Computer Science. Uh, and my job initially was to run the Twitter account for, for the department. So I basically wrote about other people's computer science research. And that research turned out to be pretty cool. I thought I might want to do some of it myself. So ultimately, I, I changed majors to computer science um, and, and found uh, a lot of opportunities. It seemed like anything you could project on a 2D screen, if you could dream it and put it on a 2D screen, you could basically build it. Even the 2D screen pieces was pretty optional, it turned out. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this. And as time went on, I did more, more of my own research, um, got, got involved in, in you know, some pretty cutting edge stuff in computer vision as well as parallel computing. And those two areas are, are kind of things I've been interested in ever since. And so I was, uh, had a great time kind of you know, writing a few papers, advancing the state of the art, at least in my own way, uh, as an undergraduate. And as I got close to graduation, um, you know, I started to think about what to do next. And what a lot of my friends were doing coming out of University of Illinois, uh, undergraduate degrees in computer science was doing kind of entry level jobs in big companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, or uh, well, I guess I'm dating myself, but, but Zynga. And, um, you know, it was, it was think of fairly narrow jobs again, you know, not, not a lot of lateral movement, not a lot of big picture thinking seemed to be, you know, kind of accessible in these. Um, so I kind of passed on that. The next thing I looked at, which a few of my friends were doing was starting companies. So I basically can't, you know, really get away with doing this slide without mentioning malware bytes. So, you know, just a few feet away from me in the same classes, uh, the CEO of malware bytes was, was starting his company at the time. And, and today, actually, when I drive up in M101, actually go by malware bytes as skyscraper in Santa Clara. So, you know, they've got a few years on, on me. Um, and, and so there definitely were people starting interesting companies. Uh, but um, by and large, what I saw was with a lot of folks doing kind of smartphone app startup. So anything that used to be on a computer or on a piece of paper, people wanted to basically figure out how to do that on an iPhone or an Android. Uh, maybe a little bit broader than that, right? But you know, it was a lot of front end, a lot of UI stuff, which I knew no, almost nothing about. And what I was really interested in was deep technology in terms of, of parallel computing and, and, and computer vision. And I didn't see the overlap there. And so there's this little corner over here that was largely unexplored by my, my graduating class, which is grad school, and in particular doing a PhD and having a research career. Um, so um, today, if you look at people at Stanford or Berkeley in undergrad, lots of people want to go to do a PhD. But back then, um, I basically had to, you know, with the help of a couple advisors, figure out how to, how to apply to grad school. I had basically no peers, you know, doing this. Um, and so I ultimately chose UC Berkeley. Uh, so I started my PhD at, at Berkeley in 2012 and, uh, you know, took on an advisor, basically worked with with Kurt Kreutzer. And the reason I chose Kurt is because he shared my three of my most core interests. You know, he's working basically at the intersection of parallel computing and computer vision, basically to make computer vision run faster. Um, and he was highly entrepreneurial, right? So Kurt had previously been uh, one of the early employees at Synopsys, which ultimately went IPO and became the CTO of Synopsys. And then um, in the late 90s, transitioned to Berkeley to become a professor. So working with Kurt was a great fit. And you know, while a lot of people in, in computer vision and what eventually became deep learning land um, were working mainly on improving the accuracy of computer vision and, and deep learning systems, we had a more broad initiative that we were working on. We were basically doing kind of you know, improving all aspects, not just accuracy, but also trying to make the most efficient and broadly applicable uh, deep learning models. And I guess when I say broadly applicable, I mean running it on almost any kind of embedded or low cost hardware. Um, so we basically came up with our own 
techniques to scale the training of deep neural nets to more processors, which allowed us to very quickly explore the design space of different types of deep neural nets that we could, we could uh, build, um, which led to um, quite interesting discoveries in, in small and efficient deep neural nets. Uh, I guess the one that we're best known for is called SqueezeNet, which, uh, which now you, it doesn't seem like you can go to a trade show uh, for, for hardware without seeing some processor companies showcasing SqueezeNet running on their, on their devices. Uh, we also learned a lot about developing our own data sets, and then we, we had our own, you know, basically developed our own uh, implementations of deep neural nets specifically for um, embedded hardware, like what you'd find in a cell phone or, as it turns out, a car. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, Kurt and I were, well, actually, let me say one more thing before I move on. So this, this is sort of my first crystallized view of what does it mean to do full stack deep learning. Um, I think what a lot of people think it is, what deep learning is, is kind of just developing new deep neural net architectures, maximizing accuracy, and leaving kind of all other costs to run wild. We had this kind of slightly broader view of, of what are the key activities in, in discovering and improving uh, better deep neural net architectures. Um, but anyway, so, so Kurt and I were, you know, were and I guess still are highly entrepreneurial. And so naturally we thought about how to build a company that uses some of these technologies. And the first thing that we tried um, was basically we had this really fast uh, distributed deep neural, deep neural net training system, which at the time was actually faster than, than some of the published numbers from Google. And we basically thought that um, we could go to companies and say, hey, um, bring us your deep neural nets, bring us your data, hopefully bring us some money, and we'll train your deep neural nets faster than anybody else can. And so this is actually one of the first slides that we showed to potential customers of DeepScale about two and a half years ago. And um, we actually got a lot of interest in this. Uh, we also put up a website that, that looked uh, maybe even slightly less good graphic design than, than this. And, and that was sort of a lightning rod for, for interest from all kinds of different industries where people had this problem of, uh, I'm trying to train deep neural nets, but it's taking forever, and I really want to be able to make progress faster than that. So um, when we would talk to potential customers, um, you know, first of all, the customers that really leapt, leapt out at us the most were, were people from the auto industry. And um, this is just pure coincidence. I hadn't gone trying to start an automotive company. I'd basically given up on my, my dream of going into automotive. But just sort of, uh, it turned out that um, automakers had gathered lots of data for training computer vision models, um, particularly for use in, in autonomous driving. Um, and they were finding that training neural nets on these very large data volumes uh, can be really slow. It can take months, or if you actually run the jobs to completion, even years. And they, they pretty much immediately picked up on the idea that DeepScale's distributed fast you know, neural net training system could help them a lot. Um, but you know, as we thought about how to build this out, we of course had more questions for the customers. Um, you know, what interfaces should we define? What types of, of neural nets do we care about? all the usual logistical matters. And as we spent more time with the customers trying to answer those questions, they brought us to something entirely new. Uh, basically, the, the automakers, and by automakers I really mean engineers at, at car companies, uh, broadly speaking, wanted to just get the right deep neural nets from us that were already trained. Um, you know, they had lots of work to do, training new neural nets for, for computer vision, you know, what didn't rank high on the internal priority list. They wanted this to just materialize and they're willing to pay for it on a per vehicle basis. Um, the other issue that came up a lot is automakers would say, um, we're sort of interested in, in uh, you know, GPUs and multiple GPUs, large scale hardware for prototyping of autonomous vehicles, but for mass production um, of, of autonomous vehicles and, and driver assistance systems, we'll need you to squeeze that down into very small hardware. Um, you know, kind of like a $20 automotive equivalent of a cell phone processor was sort of the, the thing they were looking for. And that typically has on the order of 100 times less computation per second that it can achieve compared to a full-size you know, server GPU. Um, and so that, those challenges were, were really well aligned with the, the stack that we'd internally developed at, at what we were uh, by this point calling DeepScale. And um, you know, basically what was really exciting to me was it wasn't just that the auto industry wanted the deep neural nets that I've been working on for years. It was that the auto industry um, wanted the product of the full stack of the exact things that we've been building. So they didn't just want one of these four things. They wanted us to go off by ourselves, do all four, and build them a solution that would solve some of their problems. 
And that brings us up to where we are today and where we've been for about a year and a half now at DeepScale. So we, you know, our, our sort of crystallized view of what we do is we build perception systems for autonomous vehicles. And by perception systems, I basically mean computer vision and computer vision-like things running on a variety of different types of sensors to generate a very high quality environmental model in real time. So where are the objects? What kind of objects are they? How are they moving? These are the kinds of questions that we answer many times per second on a vehicle um, using very low cost processors. So um, to sum up the first half of this talk, kind of put my whole story in one slide. Um, I, I plan to start a truck company, you know, growing up, uh, really believed that this is what I was going to do. Um, continued that dream, you know, wanted to study mechanical engineering in college, uh, ended up fi finding that going into doing really big picture meaningful work in automotive would take quite some time. Um, so ended up switching to computer science. Uh, as I was wrapping up my undergrad degree, considered, um, I considered starting a startup but chose grad school instead. Uh, by 2013, deep learning had become more or less the dominant paradigm in computer vision, and that's the kind of engineering I've been doing ever since. Uh, 2016, finished my PhD, and that was the same year that we pivoted DeepScale to focus entirely on the auto industry. And today, DeepScale is on track to supply life-saving deep learning technology to automakers in millions of vehicles. And so I, I do sometimes think to myself, would I rather have that trunk company or would I rather be supplying AI technology to all different kinds of car and truck companies? Um, I think I prefer the latter um, because I, I really feel that this piece of technology is one, has some of the most interesting, intellectually stimulating and exciting questions uh, to solve and problems to solve in an entire car. And so I'm really glad this is what we ended up doing and, and what, what my life's work has turned out to be so far. Um, so this reminds me of something that Steve Jobs said in a commencement address at Stanford uh, a little over 10 years ago, which is that you, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. And I feel my dots have really just connected in the last year or two, and that's something I really, I'm really excited about. And I guess if this were just a kind of TED talk or something, I would basically kind of you know, accept the cheers and, and walk off stage but I'd like to actually teach you something about what you might also be able to do um, uh, as well. And so my journey to become a full stack deep learning engineer as well as kind of actualizing my goals in the auto industry has been an extremely complex and time consuming journey. And the thing I'd like to talk about now is how can you ramp up on full stack deep learning engineering a lot faster than I did? Um, what, what can you do to kind of dive in quickly? And in, in this part, I'm gonna kind of talk about two key things. I'll first spend um, maybe 10 minutes or so thinking about what really is the full stack of skills, and I think you'll find that it's broader than you think it is. And then I'll move on to you know, how do you really connect with that, um, engage, uh, many of you already have, of course, and how do you make the next leap to really having a broad full stack skill set in this field? So I, I earlier showed you that kind of triangle with, with the thing hanging off the bottom. That was my first attempt at defining the full stack of of deep, deep neural net engineering. This is kind of what it's crystallized to today. And these are basically, you know, kind of pretty simple words, but they have a pretty specific, well, broad, but also, also clear meaning to me. And let me kind of brief you, briefly tell you what each of these mean, and then I'll go into them in a bit more detail. So by data, I mean um, not just gathering data, but the entire workflow of how to define what the right data is, to collect it, to curate it, to annotate it, and to manage that, that whole life cycle of, of data in a deployed product. Um, by models, I don't just mean developing new neural net architectures, but I mean the entire scope of things, including um, new loss functions, new types of layers, new types of math, and so forth. By infrastructure, I mean every single line of code that in some way underpins deep neural net training, uh, inference, or evaluation. And by applications, I mean anything that you might use this for in practice. So let me kind of go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So by data, what a lot of people think of is just kind of go collect some data, right? So this is one of DeepScale's uh, vehicles. It has sensors on it. You go, go around and get data. That's data, right? Um, there, there are a few more things. Um, I don't even purport to have them all on the slide, but at least five more of these things are, um, but how do we get the right labels or annotations for the data? And what are the right annotations? You know, how do we define them anyway? So you know, when, by task definition, I mean things like 
you see, you know, this is a semantic segmentation ground truth mask. Um, those dashed lines, do, do we agree that when there's a dashed line in the road and, and, and a lane marker, that those dashes should be their own annotations? Or should that be annotated as one line that has a property called dashed? Um, when you see a car, do you want to include the mirrors and the antenna in the correct answer for where is that car in the image or no? Um, when you see parts of the road that are undrivable but don't have any lane marking that's kind of part of your data set, what do you do, right? So you end up with, in terms of task definition, a 10 or maybe even 100 page manual for um, annotators who are going through and either curating or, or kind of annotating or correcting the data that you've, you've labeled. Um, so that, that becomes a quite um, thought intensive task to define what exactly is the right answer um, when labeling. Uh, data storage ends up becoming quite a big issue, not just as you have more data, but as you have more types of data. So I found that once you start going into not just cameras, but LIDARs and radars, and if you're more on the text side, different types of text data or different types of audio data, um, you pretty quickly go outside what the, the standard data formats can really do for you. And by the time you have two or three types of, of data that are coming out at some sort of time synchronized fashion, um, a lot of the existing data formats out there really aren't designed to handle that. You need to basically build up your own. Um, simulation data, um, so think game engines and things like game engines, for example, uh, turn out to be pretty useful in, in the training uh, of, of deep neural networks. And my personal belief is that for a lot of tasks that use deep learning, uh, a mix of real world data and simulated data tends to be a good choice for, for kind of maximizing robustness, but also generalization. And then accuracy metrics. So this kind of ties in with task definition. So is there a way that we can summarize how well we're doing in terms of correctness or accuracy in just a few numbers? And the reality is sometimes we can, and for some tasks, we really can't. Um, but you, you may end up with, for any given task, several different metrics that you're tracking that you invented yourself because you're doing a new task that hasn't been in any, any of the previous papers. Um, so these are some of the things around data. And as you can see, I'm kind of using data not just as the data itself, but all the things that, that sort of drive exactly what is the thing that the deep neural net is supposed to learn. So models. Um, I think what some people think models is about is coming up with new model structures. So you've heard of SqueezeNet or AlexNet or GoogleNet. We make another one of those, that's, that's models, right? Well, that's part of it. But there are actually a lot of other things, um, some of which I probably haven't even thought to put on this slide. But examples of what else goes into models, uh, you know, deep model um, research and development is um, pre-processing and featureization. So what do you do to your data before you pass it into the deep neural net and what do you do after? Um, objective functions, uh, you know, developing new objective functions is sort of bread and butter for people who are solving new problems with deep neural nets. By objective function, I basically mean the way that you penalize the neural net when it makes mistakes, right? Basically, how do you define the difference between What's the neural net generating is the right answer and what's the actual right answer? Those are some different ways to think about objective functions. And coming up with new ones is, is pretty much a requirement when, when going outside of kind of widely studied deep neural net problems and into a deep neural net problem that you're developing for yourself. Um, developing new layer types. So if you look at a deep neural net framework like uh, TensorFlow or MXNet or CAFE2, you'll often find tens, maybe low hundreds of different types of deep neural net layers or data transformations that are kind of part of that framework. And 100 types of, of layers seems like a lot until you think about, um, you know, in your three semesters in college of calculus that you may have taken, you know, everything in that, those three volumes of th those dusty books are differentiable math that could go in a neural net, right? Any kind of math function that you can either compute a derivative of or even estimate one could go in a neural net. So from that perspective, as a community, we've only started to scratch the surface of what are all the different layers and functions that could go inside a neural net. Um, quantization and compression. So this is typically, once I've already trained a neural net, what things can I do to further you know, compress it? Uh, can I um, you know, truncate its weights or, or quantize its weights from say 32 bits to six or eight bits? Can I delete some of the parameters? What else can I do to squeeze, to squeeze it down after it's been trained? Uh, can I make sparse basis functions? These kinds of considerations. Uh, often this quantization and compression stuff happens after you're done training, but there's no reason it has to. It could be unified with your training process. And then um, sort of as a meta one of these, design space exploration is 
is the sort of the general term of for any of these things as well as other aspects of models, how do we efficiently explore different options? Uh, maybe without trying every conceivable option, but you know, gradually uh, searching for something that works well, as well as understanding what the trade-offs really are. So these are some of the key things that go into model development. Uh, infrastructure, I think what a lot of people kind of think of uh, basically for infrastructure, okay, maybe some people think Docker containers, but you know, for, for deep learning infrastructure, the thing that's mostly in the news is what neural net framework are you using? Is that new one that just came out? Um, so some common ones today, uh, MXNet, uh, TensorFlow, CAFE2, PyTorch, um, and, and others. But uh, there's actually a whole set of things that surround these, these frameworks in practice. So above the framework, you have a number of things, including visualization tools. So how do I track how well my neural net is learning, uh, what's inside of it, as well as what kind of output it's generating? Um, so for those who can't quite see, this is just kind of an impressionistic. The left one is sort of a, a loss function converging. The middle one is some visualizations of neural net filters and the right one is, is uh, uh, object detection output visualization. These are the kinds of things, right? Um, and then lower down, on, on the left side, these are more oriented towards training, typically. So when you want to scale your training beyond a single server, you have to think about distributed communication of, of model updates. And that turns out to be quite a hard problem, um, as well as more generally how to scale your training to large scale hardware. Do you apply model parallelism, uh, batch parallelism, um, sub-image parallelism, et cetera. And then on the right side, um, you know, both for training and deployment or inference, you need um, efficient computational kernels that run on whatever platform you're working with. So somebody has to sit down and either write or write it, the thing to generate a really efficient implementation of things like convolution. And that's a non-trivial problem. It's actually quite, quite uh, labor intensive. And I don't think there are that many people on the planet who quite know how to do it yet. Um, and then deploying on cloud with embedded hardware, so I think the kernels tend to get a lot of attention, but dealing with the, the kind of obscure, confusing OS that goes with some particular type, <laughs> type of embedded hardware or some particular um, cloud instance type, that, that takes quite a bit of work too. So this is sort of a, somewhat of a survey of what goes into infrastructure. And then um, applications. So this one is less of an attempt to kind of taxonomize what are the different things and more just for you to think about what kinds of applications this get applied to today. So I sometimes break it into two categories, uh, data centers and gadgets. So on, on the left, this is uh, applying deep neural nets to uh, things that don't need a physical embodiment in the real world. It's, I've got some data, uh, maybe even a, a streaming data feed. I'm living in a data center and I'm analyzing social media or consumer data. I'm indexing the web. Uh, I'm doing intelligence and so forth. Um, and then on the right, gadgets, this is stuff that goes out in the real world. Um, so aside from smartphones, all of these other ones, self-driving cars, drones, and, ro and, and robots in general, tend to be quite real-time constrained and safety critical. So you have to get the right answer in real time or bad things happen. Um, and I would say the data center side on the left, you know, efficiency and speed certainly matter uh, a good deal. I mean, power isn't free. But on the right, you know, unless you can really implement this, th these deep neural nets compactly in a a, a real-time way, you end up with something that's just not usable. And so I would say the stuff on the right, the gadget world, is actually just getting warmed up. I think we're kind of at less than 1% of the opportunity for putting deep neural nets in gadgets has really been exploited to date, I would say. Okay, that, that, that was a mouthful. Uh, so those are kind of the four pieces of the stack that, that uh, you know, kind of, at least in my estimation, go into full stack deep neural net development. Let's talk a bit about how to orchestrate these into teams. So, um, sorry, I, I don't have a good graphic for silos, so I use huts. Um, but, uh, so, so there are four huts. Uh, data feeds models, which feeds infrastructure, which feeds applications. This is how a lot of people do it in practice. So if you look inside companies that do a lot of deep learning, you'll find that these people in different huts are in different buildings, different continents, don't talk to each other. Uh, this is something I've seen quite a bit. Um, and it, it gets even more extreme when you look at the research community. So you'll find there are actually different conferences for each of these huts, and the people who go to one hut don't go to the other hut. Um, so the people who are designing new neural net models often don't know that much about infrastructure or don't know that many infrastructure people and vice versa. So what I find happens a lot is you'll have the infrastructure people doing a really good job of trying to implement last year's deep neural net model that isn't really a good fit for that infrastructure or that hardware platform they're trying to run on. And vice versa, you get the um, 
models people designing neural nets with kind of naive metrics like uh, you know, accuracy, of course, matters, but their way of defining how fast it will run is you know, just how many floating point operations does it do. But there's a lot more to um, you know, how much computation do you need than just the number of floating point operations. How, how much memory do you use? What's your arithmetic intensity? These are things that your infrastructure people are going to often know all about. And so getting these people in one room turns out to be really important. Um, so building, building these kind of open-ended workflows between the data people, the model people, the infrastructure people, working together, um, I personally found in my experience, tends to lead to much more optimal results. And the applications people maybe aren't in the inner loop of this, but they shouldn't be too far away. The applications people shouldn't be relegated to just downloading pre-trained neural nets off the internet and hoping it works. They should actually have a real voice in how this whole engineering process works. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how we do this at deep scale. So I think you know, compared to, say, Facebook AI research, um, so at Facebook AI research or Google Brain, um, I think the view is most people should have a PhD. People should come in being very experienced in at least one of these areas. Um, at DeepScale, I found that actually a mix of experts and generalists tends to be a really successful combination as well. And um, we typically have the PhDs and experts serve as mentors to the more junior people, right? So those mentors spend a good part of their day teaching others and helping others with their projects so that they can also become experts. Um, Ah, let me repeat the question. So the question is, how much time do those experts spend teaching instead of instead of doing individual work? Is that the right question? Yes, because That's a great question. So how do we deal with the fact that situation of some such and such work has to be done next week? We should have the expert just work on that, right? So sometimes that makes sense, but I think a lot of the time, you know, at deep scale, and I guess in Silicon Valley, often we're optimizing for a year or two years down the road. At deep scale, we're playing a much longer term game. And I'd like to see in five or 10 years for us to have a really um, robust and, and substantially sized full stack deep learning team. And, and for us, rather than kind of, I mean, I feel like having those experts not teach is sort of like eating your seed corn, right? You, you should have saved that to plant next year. Right? So we can basically build this kind of talent factory if the experts do take a good chunk of their time to teach. So rather than doing that much stuff hands-on, they, they help others do, do their work. Um, I think this isn't super uncommon. I mean, principal engineers in a lot of big companies do end up doing a lot of mentoring and teaching. And not everywhere, but yeah. What is the split between mentoring and, and individual contributor work? I don't know what the exact split is. Um, I think we've been more oriented towards building a culture of teaching and learning is really important and will pay off in the long run. Um, I, I guess one downside of not tracking exactly how people spend their time is I don't know quite the answer to, is it half and half or, or what? Uh, okay, we'll have an impromptu question session. Yeah, sure, let me, uh, yeah. Right. I think I get the question. So the question is, um, it's great to think about the idea of having these three types of engineers sit together, but what happens when you have hundreds of engineers? Uh, how do you scale that? So I've seen two answers to that um, in the wild. Um, so, um, uh, so one of my, uh, well, not quite lab mates, but so Brian Cotanzaro, who's now the, the, let me see if I get this right, I think Vice President of Applied AI at, at uh, NVIDIA, some such thing. He, he basically ran, so he, he was, uh, went through the same research group I did at Berkeley. Um, and for a while, he was one of the, the key people in Baidu's, uh, Baidu Research's speech recognition effort. And so basically, it was Brian leading what, what, what I hear called the infrastructure side. And then it was Adam Coates, you know, Andrew Ring's former PhD student, leading the um, model side. So yeah, so Brian would, do, would, would lead infrastructure, Adam would lead models. And by a certain point, I don't know the exact numbers, but there were at least probably a couple dozen people working under each. And so they would all report into that manager slash mentor, but they would collaborate individually, right? That's one approach. Um, maybe not hundreds, but at least tens of people. And then the other approach I've seen um, is, you know, 
I don't know everything there is to know about Google Brain, but I at least know some people there who have worked in these cross-functional groups where you get um, relatively small groups of people where there's the infrastructure and, and beta people actually indeed sitting next to each other, but often they come in as experts. Um, we're kind of noodling around with different ways of doing this. Um, I, I think one is to have uh, sort of a, a kind of a two-dimensional structure for, for your company. Um, so there, there's some companies that have popularized this. Um, if you look at um, Spotify, for example, they talk a lot about their kind of two-dimensional matrix, where in one dimension you've got mentoring groups, and the other dimension you've got product groups. So that's one direction that, that we're leaning towards heading in as we grow. But I think it's not an easy question. I think part of why less people do this um, is because it's it's somewhat hard to orchestrate these, but without doing this, you end up with pretty suboptimal engineering outcomes. So when people work in these teams for a while, if, if they're really lucky, they may start to become full stack deep learning engineers. So deep skills been in the business for about two and a half years, and I've seen at least a couple people make the leap from a uh, leader or expert in one of these areas to doing all of these quite proficiently. And what you get when you have a full stack deep learning engineer is, is somebody who can make these trade-offs in their head. They go, let me change the model like this. I'll, 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 change, I'll change these layers out for those layers. I'll, I'll make these adjustments to the loss function. I'll go over here and change the data like this to better match the end application we're aiming for. I'll go change the infrastructure so it all trains faster and to try to do a better mapping between the model I designed and the hardware I'm running on. And I understand the application quite well and can make those informed trade-offs. When, when you have all that in your head, you don't have to have weekly meetings to sync up on those things. You have minute by minute decision making uh, of those trade-offs. And I've, I've seen in action how powerful um, this can be. Uh, I don't think everybody is ultimately going to become this person. And I think this person may not always be the best at all four of those, but they're pretty proficient. And I think that's good enough. Um, so basically, this is a rare breed, but, but it's immensely powerful. And, and, and the, more, the more someone can do this, I think, I think in some ways, the more powerful they become in their engineering capabilities. Um, so let me show you an example of what DeepScale's full stack team has accomplished. Uh, naturally, I don't have a lot of time, so this is just scratching the surface of the kind of thing that we've done. But uh, sorry, that is a little washed out looking on this screen. But you know, on the left, we have object detection running in real time, and on the right, we have um, a depth, uh, depth based, kind of a depth oriented point cloud generated from just a camera. So basically, the one on the right is, is for example, if you don't have LiDAR, if your LiDAR has failed, you can use this pretty good point cloud to fall back on um, for depth estimations. On the left, this is, this is doing um, basically deep neural net based uh, detections of objects. So um, this is something that you know, we've, we've been able to develop using our own data uh, to run real time. How many, let's get some volunteers. How many, um, how many parts of the stack do you think we used? Anybody want to call out an answer? Yeah, how many parts of the stack did we use to do this? All of them, yeah, we used them all. So we have our own data, uh, put, put our, you know, collect our own data using, using cameras, LIDARs, as well as radars, um, built our own data formats for data storage of time synchronization of all those different sensors. Um, develop custom deep neural nets that, that run in real time on a compute constrained environment while preserving quite high quality and accuracy. Um, develop their own infrastructure. So this is on our own custom framework uh, on embedded uh, automotive grade processors as opposed to just a, a server or a desktop. Um, we made our own visualization tools to do this. Um, actually, this, this is sort of cut out of, this basically runs in a browser typically for us. Um, and then we, we put in a lot of effort um, to really understand what is the end goal of the, the automakers and automotive companies that, that ultimately are buying this product from us. So, so we've kind of taken this full stack view and it's, it's really paid off with high quality results like this. So, um, you know, kind of back, back, to, back to, you know, kind of advice. So uh, how does one get started down this path towards um, full stack deep neural net engineering? So here's my advice. So, and some of you in the audience already will have done the following, so, so that's great. Um, but my advice is um, first go deep, right? Um, bring the skills that you already have to the most full stack deep learning engineering team that you can find. So um, basically my, my hypothesis here is that a lot of the people in the audience who have some engineering training are already good at some piece of that stack. I mean, I showed what um, 
uh, 15, 20 different, different pieces when you go through all the submodules. There's a lot there. Um, so I think there will be some piece of that that you already know more than the average engineer about. Um, and, and in terms of, of um, applying this to a project, um, you know, take those existing skills to a project which either could be with a group with complementary skills, or if you want to work on your own or if that makes more sense, try to find a project that really plays to your strengths. So if you're really good at visualization, visualize what's going on on the inside and outside of somebody else's deep neural net. Build the best tool for that. Um, if you're really good at, at more the electrical engineering or computer architecture side, go figure out how to map some reasonably good deep neural net to some really specialized piece of hardware. Um, if you're really good at um, developing deep neural net models and no other aspect of this, well, do some more of that for a while. Um, but then ultimately, I think the goal is to go wide. So if you want to become that person, um, my advice is once you've built up some skills in the deep learning field, start challenging yourself to learn new skills. Um, I think there are lots of opportunities to learn. So if you've been working with a group from, from the previous slide, uh, you've probably already learned a lot from your team members who have different skills. Um, if you're in a company, hopefully you can find at least some people who have skills that complement uh, yours. And if you're working on your own, there are more opportunities by the day to to self-study and to find online materials that can help you teach, help teach you more of the stack. So I think I'm near the end of my time here. Um, so I'd like to, to try to draw some conclusions. So um, hopefully, if nothing else, I've convinced you that full stack deep learning engineering um, doesn't, isn't just about training neural net models all day. It actually spans many disciplines. Um, for those of you who are entrepreneurs or managers in the audience, um, if you'd like to do deep learning at scale in, in, in a real product, you'll likely need to build um, something resembling a full stack deep learning team. And for the engineers in the audience, um, there are lots of ways of, I've only just mentioned a few, uh, lots of ways to get into deep learning and ultimately to potentially become a full stack deep learning engineer. So uh, thanks again for your time. And before I take questions, let me just throw up one last slide which is, so DeepScale is going to be hoping to hosting an open house uh, this summer. We're in the process of moving to a bigger office uh, over in Mountain View. And so one thing, hmm. all right, I'm back. Uh, so so once, once, we're, once we're in that new office and situated, we'll be having an open house. Uh, here, here's, here's our uh, team at DeepScale, for those of you who don't already know this. And um, so if you'd like to be, if you'd like to be, get some updates on this as, as the, the details materialize, uh, please do email me at fi at deepscale.ai and use the sub subject line uh, deepscale open house. Okay, time for questions. As, as always, we've set aside you know a reasonable amount of time for questions, and it's a great time to you know get your questions answered. But please, if you could raise your hand and let me come by with the microphone so that everybody can hear the question. Uh, it's always confusing to hear the answer if you don't. So uh, let's start over here. Sure. So what kind of processors do we run on, for example, for the demo that we showed? So our, our bread and butter is to run on uh, low-cost automotive grade processors. So um, if we're using surround view, kind of 360 degree sensing, we may use uh, something, uh, whether it's exactly or something resembling kind of an NVIDIA GPU. But once we start going down into just forward facing or just a certain direction, um, we're actually able to squeeze our, our current models down onto um, very low cost, for example, 20 or $30 uh, system on chips that come from companies like Texas Instruments or, um, or Renesas or NXP. And those typically are based on ARM plus some other accelerators that, that will come with it. I see. So who do we optimize for when hiring? Is it uh, straight out of undergrad, straight out of a PhD, or more experience? Um, I, I don't know. I think everybody, every person is a little bit different, right? So I, I kind of look for a variety of different skills and different people. So I think having, having that core of people with experience, whether they've got experience with a PhD or something else, is great. Um, but th those folks can really be amplified in terms of their efforts if they work with a bunch of more junior people who, who can learn from them. So um, I think all of the above are, are quite important. Yeah. So basically it's, um, when, when a new person comes, how do, like people learn differently, right? So how do, how do we find the right learning style for them? Is that kind of what you're thinking? Uh, 
Uh, so I think we've, and, and may, some of this is still a bit aspirational because we're still kind of trying different things and ramping up. But what I envision that we'll see um, get more crystallized in the next few months, you see in the university, they're, they're at the university, the university teaching titles are often there for, for a reason, but different things appeal to different people. So you'll have um, office hours for those who learn one-on-one. -on -one. You'll have classes for those who, who want to kind of learn from, from things being explained uh, generally. And then you'll have um, projects and stuff for people who learn more in a project-based way, right? So I think trying to have it so there are a bunch of different resources you can pull on and you as an individual get to use the ones that work for you is, is what, I would, what I would like to, to see as we, as we grow. I think I see one there. Is the microphone, we're just gonna set that one out. Okay, I'll just repeat the question. I see. So what kind of model do we use for object detection and what kind of work do people do to create those models? Is that a question? Okay, great. So what kind of model? I mean, so I don't know how much I can say right now, but um, you know, you can retrace some of the ideas that we've gotten back to papers like Faster RCNN or Mask RCNN, as well as, as YOLO, as well as our, our own models that we published like SqueezeDebt, for example. Um, you know, we kind of have that, that, that family of ideas and others that we've, we've, we've injected, right? But you, know, you can think of it as a model where uh, there's a deep neural net that, that takes you know, images and or other types of data as input. And then in the output, you, you're back propagating you know, the correct bounding boxes and categories of objects. That's the type of thing, the, the exact details. Um, I, I think we have, have some magical things that we, we aren't really comfortable to share. So that's a two part question. Let me give you the second part first. And hey, hey, Paris, would you be interested to answer the first part? Okay, like, I mean, like once I give you the microphone. Okay, so in terms of like when, when talking to candidates about, um, you know, do we, do we interview more for, if you use a particular neural net framework versus you have more general skills, I'd say we lean more towards general skills. Um, I think good software engineers are, they can be hard to find, right? So core software engineering skills are great. Um, so if someone has kind of a lot of intuition about deep neural nets, that intuition tends to transfer over different implementations of that. Um, so I think, um, you know, and not everybody has to do all these things right away. So, you know, if, if you actually aren't an expert in any of those frameworks or, or in Python, but you really have a lot of intuition about, about what makes a good deep neural net, that's, that's great too. So I think we're, we're pretty, pretty broad in that sense. I'm about to hand the mic over to uh, Paras Jane, who's one of our uh, engineers at, at DeepScale, to answer the other question about uh, how we choose frameworks for different projects. Yeah, um, hey, uh, so uh, with regard to choosing frameworks, um, we're just gonna set up, sorry. Yeah, with regard to charge, uh, choosing frameworks, it's a little less important in my mind. Um, things we look for specifically is uh, if we can dive down and really customize how kernels execute in the, in the framework. So um, internally, one of, the, one of the key frameworks we use is MXNet, Apache MXNet. Um, and that's because we can go ahead and go in and customize CUDA kernels specifically for the type of models we're building, custom operators. Like Forrest mentioned, there's a huge variety of operators which just are not represented in frameworks today. So being able to build our own is pretty important. Um, it's becoming less and less important with interoperability layers like um, the Onyx project, for example, um, where you know if you train a model in PyTorch, you can export it and run it in, say, MXNet or something. Um, internally, one of the things we have built is um, a compilation and a virtual machine stack that allows us to kind of take models from Onyx, in fact, and um, be able to run them on small embedded processors. And that's really useful because, you know, our researchers, they can come from anywhere, right? From they, if, I mean, if, they, if they've worked with PyTorch or Cafe2 or something, you know, we'll let them be productive in what they really are maximally productive on. I mean, as long as, you know, the team and other people they work with um, are also productive in that. Thanks, Morris. Uh, do we have more questions? Okay, good. So two questions. Uh, the first one is um, at at deep scale. Are we just doing perception, or do we do other tasks as well for autonomous driving? And the second question is there. There was some news about Uber that you'd like me to address, and I'm happy to do that. So I guess um, first of all, um, in terms of of are we going outside perception? 
I think similar to the companies like DeepMap, for example, who have really found a, a really interesting niche in, in just mapping the environment, kind of collecting offline data for what's going on around the car that's sort of consistent about the environment. You know, where, where's the road? Where are the lane lines? There, there's sort of a parallel business opportunity that we've identified in understanding what's going on around the car right now. And that can be kind of combined with a mapping system um, in a complementary way. I, I found that the closer you get to the actuators that, that manipulate the car's movement, the more is unique for each vehicle. And it can be a bit tricky to figure out how to sell a general purpose um, sort of control and actuation system. There may be sort of some sweet spot. I mean, motion planning is sort of hierarchical from how do I get from you know here to some location that's 20 minutes from here, all the way down to the control piece of every few milliseconds, I'm updating my, my controller you know, actuator state. Um, but so that, that's kind of one piece of it. The other is, um, on the motion planning and actuation side, we've actually found that, that some of our customers in the auto industry really like that we're not trying to sell them a solution that does all those things. They, they're more interested in getting the perception piece from us, and they have their own ideas about motion planning and control. Um, so that's kind of where, where we've been able to you know, find our plug-in point. But, but yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I think there are also other components like um, you know, uh, better cost quality trade-offs for for GPS and positioning and, and lots of things that don't always get onto that kind of deep neural net, or, or sorry, uh, a sort of autonomous driving component map, right, that, that need to be done. So there, there's a lot there, and, and we've really focused on perception. Okay, let's, let's uh, oh, I, can, I, can I get part two? Yeah, so you're, you're asking about, yeah, so there, 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 was, there was news today that, um, that there was a, a collision involving an Uber car and, and a pedestrian, uh, which, which was, was quite sad. Um, so from what I understand, the, 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 you know, since it just happened today, that it's still under investigation. And I don't really have any, any unique information to report other than um, I'm, I'm disappointed that that happened. Good. So that's probably okay. all the time we so have. Let's, let's, yes, let's take a moment to thank Forrest for his awesome talk.